I've been a marketer for 30 years. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, life. Uh, in, in that time, I've had the privilege to build businesses, brands, and organizations all over the world. And, uh, and that's what marketers do. And I fundamentally believe that in this world, as we will see very shortly, where we're becoming more global and more local at the same time, there's never been a greater need for the marketing function than now. So I define myself as, as this. I build businesses, brands, and people all over the world. And I do this by creating environments where people working together can achieve extraordinary things while finding meaning and well-being. That's my true north. When I'm doing well, my business is doing well, I am fulfilled, happy, and my team is performing great is because I am close to this true north. When I am not, there's something that needs to be adjusted. For you to define what is it that you want to do and how you want to do it is incredibly important. It took me about half of my career to figure out that this is what I did. So. Start, adjust, enjoy the ride, but it will take you a while to figure out specifically what is it that you do and what benefits you bring to your organization, to your people, and at the end of the day, to the world in, you, in which you live in. So I, I do have a passion for building brands, and I do have a passion for building global brands, and that's why Last year, when the uh, ANA, or the Association of National Advertiser in the United States, uh, decided that the term glocal was the most hated term in the marketing world, I had something to say about it. Because I do hate the term glocal. It's a cute marketing word. Probably some advertiser came up with it. And it's a made-up word, which means that it's neither one thing nor the other. And importantly, when you are involved in this business that I'm in, it is a word that is being used to justify the most offensive behavior in the world. If you are one of the global marketers that lives in headquarters, whether that's New York or San Francisco or Chicago or London, you use the word glocal to go to the markets, present your agenda, and then leave, and then tell your boss that everybody's aligned. If you're in the local market, you use the word to actually interrupt a CMO like myself on his or her way to the bathroom, show them a concept, the person like myself who has in mind the fact that he has to go to the bathroom, will say yes, and then they will go back to their general manager and say, I am completely aligned with the global strategy. I even have the OK of the CMO. This is no joke. This happens all the time. So the word has been used and abused, but I will suggest to you that there's never been a greater need for marketers around the world to have both a global and a local outlook of life. So consumers through technology, all consumers, particularly consumers of your generation, can move seamlessly from global views to local views with a tick, a tap, or a click. Whether you're talking about the Arab Spring, that became the winter and the summer, and it continues to go. Or you're talking about mobile shopping, where you're searching for something, you're asking for your friends whether they like the shoes that you took a picture on. You're in front of a store and then decided to buy it online. The fact is that we can move from global to local seamlessly as consumers. Also that in the world that we're living in, our clients are requiring that we deliver on both fronts. 
So if you are in the consumer goods world and you're dealing with Walmart, they're going to require that you deliver on global scale because they are all about cost, but also that you're able to deliver at the local market those specific market needs. And you have to do both. Competitors, we in the payment industry compete with both global competitors like Amex or Ma and MasterCard who play sometimes global games or local games, but we're also competing with local payment schemes, like in the case of China, China Union Pay, or FPOS in Australia, or Interact in Canada. So having the ability to understand the world from both its global dimension and its local dimension is an incredibly important skill to have if you want to become a, um, a global marketer. So I decided then to change the term from global to the concept of global, E, the word and in Spanish, local. It's both, and it's connected by an E because I speak Spanish and I think it sounds great. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it is fundamentally important for people that are going to start a career in my craft to understand that you are going to be evaluated by your ability to move seamlessly from global to local trends and for you to be completely comfortable in that particular world. So when you ask me what are the first things that I'm going to look for for people that are going to come to work for me at Visa or if I was re hiring for PepsiCo or even Procter or even Kraft, my previous company, having a global mindset will be area number one. And I'm going to ask you about it. And I'm going to ask you about how you feel about things that are happening in the world. And I'm going to ask you whether you have traveled. And I'm going to ask you to describe opportunities or uh, I should say experiences that you have had working with other cultures and with other environments. It's not a nice to have. It is a must have. And importantly, it delivers, it actually creates more diverse marketing teams. And I'm not talking racial diversity, I'm talking diversity of thought, which is where it really counts. And it also creates a much interesting environment for business dinners. And business dinners need, need to be fun. Otherwise, I don't have fun and uh, then I get uh, all, all grumpy. Um, I want to tell you about our story and how, how we created a, um, the concept of a global brand in Visa. It's rather atypical just because of the circumstances of, um, of our business. Believe it or not, Visa has only been a, private, uh, a publicly traded company for three years. Before that, it was an association an association that was owned by the banks around the world that we serviced. So there were, at the time, 22,000 banks that owned different pieces of Visa around the world. So we, we, we went from serving 22,000 customers to having one company with one p &L, one board of directors, and very specific objectives. Our company, just to give you some numbers and dimensions, we're operating in about 200 countries. We have 16,000 or 15,700 financial institutions. From 22 to 1,600, what you have is the consolidation of the banking industry globally over a four-year period. We have 1.8 billion cards in, si in circulation. We take 71 billion transactions each year, and we process $5.2 trillion through our system. What's interesting is we don't issue cards. We don't issue credit or debit or prepaid card. What we do is we connect the card holder with the merchant to ensure that what you're buying actually happens no matter where you are in the world in less than a second. That's what Visa does. Importantly, 
And one of the business reasons why we needed to create a different model is that we have dimensions of our business that are very global, and we have dimensions of our business that are inherently local. Take e-commerce. E-commerce, by definition, is borderless commerce. It's open. It's global. Having said that, you as a consumer are going to interact in e-commerce through local portals. So for you to understand as a marketer, that journey from the local into the global and back into the local, it's critically important. Affluent consumers, one of our, mo by, the, by the way, I should say that e-commerce is our single biggest, most important area for growth in terms of transactions. 25% of transactions globally are e-commerce, and they're growing at 30% per year. Second, the affluent consumer. The affluent consumer, again, it's the most traveled consumer by its notion, the most global of all consumers. But an affluent consumer will expect to be treated as an affluent consumer when they are traveling, but also when they're in their own country, which means that the marketing team will need to understand how to deal with that affluent consumer when they are in market in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and how to deal with that consumer, Brazilian consumer from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil when he's traveling to New York City. Third is cross-border. Some of our most profitable transactions are the cross-border, when you're going from one place to the other. Our two most profitable corridors are from Canada to the United States and from the United States to Mexico. Again, if you're going to follow that particular consumer, whether they're affluent or not, you're going to need to have that mindset to ensure that that particular consumer, when he's going hypothetically from Vancouver to San Francisco to Cabo San Luca in Mexico, that he has experiences that deliver on all of those three fronts and that he or she perceives them as a holistic benefit. And then there's the whole idea of money transfer, which means that if you're a US consumer, and by the way, again, another of the uh, profitable prepaid m corridors is Mexico, people sending money from here to Mexico, you need to understand not only the consumer when they are in the United States as a Mexican American sending money back home, but actually the journey of that money and what that money is going to be used for, because that's going to help you address that consumer in the United States in a more effective manner. So those are very tangible ex examples as to why it is so critically important for you to have both. At the same time, we have aspects of our business that are inherently local. Debit cards, or debit accounts, I should say, in those cases where there are not cards, or prepaid. The reason why they're local is because they are alternatives to cash. And the rituals of cash are inherently local. Therefore, when we are driving debit card usage in markets like Mexico, Russia, Japan, it has to be 100% local effort. So understanding the idiosyncrasies of that local consumer within that particular environment, it's what we do. So a marketing team in any of our countries will need to have the ability to drive local usage through insights, local insight, and at the same time to be able to play more global, uh, more global games. We're going to get into that. Okay. We're going to get into that. There are, uh, y yes, we're going to get into that. And speci specifically, what are the things that we're, we're doing globally and what are the things that, that, that are done um, uh, locally? So the, the, the because of the business case that I just presented, there was a need when the company became public uh, 
to have a unified approach. For the first time, when you put all these things together, people began to see, oh my god, there's global opportunity here, there's local opportunity here, there's cross-border opportunity there. So therefore, uh, we're going to need someone who puts this thing together in a cohesive sort of way. Creating an approach by which we could have some very strong global disciplines, I'll explain what that means, but at the same time, very strong local dynamism to ensure that we capture all of these opportunities. And I was lucky enough, because I consider it a, 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 a phenomenal opportunity, that I became the first ever global CMO of, uh, of Visa Inc. We needed to address four different areas in order to create what we called our global brand, which is the approach of both global e local. First, we needed to address organizational design. Second, we needed to address strategic alignment of all the different regions of the world. Third, focusing on executional excellence. And fourth, dynamic engagement across all the multiple levels of our business, all anchored in very specific business matrix. So what I want to do is um, to take it one step at a time. It was going to be impossible to have a cohesive approach to the world without dealing with, without dealing with the organizational structure. And that's something that, and I've seen this in many companies, you cannot do this by committee without having someone who's not only responsible, but importantly, he or she is accountable for delivering the goods. In our particular case, because we were not one company publicly traded, we were a constellation of divisions. Each of these divisions, Latin America, Europe, Central Europe, Middle East and Africa, so on and so forth, operated completely independent of everything else and reported to a board of advisors. The advisors were the banks that owned the service in that area of the world. So the board in the US board will be composed of banks like JP Morgan Chase and Bank of America. If you were in Latin America, it would be Itaú and Bancomer. If you were in Asia, it would be Hyundai Bank, um, and so on and so forth. What that meant is that each one of these regions was 100% independent. So the only thing that were consistent across the visa world was the brand mark, visa, and the concept of product interoperability, which means no matter where you are in the world, your card is going to work. Everything else was different. So if you took my same example of the consumer who was going from Vancouver to San Francisco to Cabo, that consumer was going to be able to identify acceptance through our brand mark in all three places, which was consistent. But the brand experience, the messaging around it, was going to be completely, completely different. So the brand in, the brand in essence was five brands around the world with five positioning statements with five communication strategies, with five media agencies, with five strategic agencies, with five digital agencies. So you had a very big portfolio of suppliers and a lot of redundancy. Why? Because each one of these areas wanted to have total control of all the dynamics of the marketing and the business mix. Each one of the region's lead was a CMO with ultimate decision over the brand and the only person that they had to agree with was the president of that particular region. 
importantly because since there was no PNL, any time a region wanted to do something like acquiring assets, like the Olympics or whatever it may be in a region, the Rugby World Cup, all they had to do was present it to their banks. The banks will see it in terms of their level of participation, which was divided based on their volume, and they will go thumbs up or thumbs down, and that was it. No return on investment decision, no, which is what we need to do right now. So we had to, the first step was if we want to have one glo global brand that will manifest itself differently around the world, we're going to need to consolidate the structure and create one. And we're going to actually make each one of the regions report directly into the chief marketing officer, which in my case was, um, was me. As you can imagine, this was not very popular and I was not a very popular guy at the time. I called my mom and I said, you know, your ears are gonna be ringing very frequently. If you wake up in the middle of the night and, and, you, and you listen to an insult that it's either in Japanese or in Portuguese, it's me. Um, but this was critical to ensure that this, the right decisions were going to be made. Importantly, and I've done this in other types of company, whether you're going through an IPO or not going through an IPO, you need to have one person that is going to be ultimately responsible for driving the alignment. Without that, I can tell you, based on experience, it will not happen by spontaneous generation. Most of the time, when you put five marketers together and you tell them whether they are going to like and enjoy playing in teams, they're going to say, absolutely. What they're actually thinking is, we're gonna play as a team, everybody is gonna follow my lead, and I am going to be a very happy person. I'm not exaggerating. I'm, I'll get to you in a, in a minute. I am not exaggerating. That's the nature. Why? Because you wanna make a mark in the world. And you've been given an asset called the Visa brand, and you own the Visa brand. There's nothing more fulfilling than that. So now, all of a sudden, you have to talk to this guy who has a weird accent and you're gonna have to share your decision-making authority, and by the way, he can even overrule you? What about my legacy? It's hard, it's really hard work. I'll tell you in a minute how we dealt with that emotional component of the alignment equation, which is as hard, as if not harder than the rational dimension of the alignment equation. I'm sorry, you were gonna ask something. Step one was this under, under here, there are different dimensions, okay? So there is a global team that is developed, uh, split by key initiatives, but those people report into me, they don't have direct line responsibility from their equivalent at the, at the, regional, at the regional level. So yes, both, both are important, but at this stage, it was about alignment, so we said, okay, the most transformational cultural shift was from independent unit to, to one. Um, I, I, I have to say that one of the most important element on this was that this was not my initiative. This was the initiative of the CEO. And by the way, it was an initiative that was endorsed by the board of directors. And that's critically important. When companies say, I want to have a global brand, if the CEO is not ready to stand stand up and say, I am going to support the global brand approach, it's not going to happen. Because we are not generous people as much as we like to think we are. We like to fight it off. And by the way, I can assure you that every one of those, um, and, and, and the benefit that I have is throughout my career, I was able to manage small country, big country, regionals, international and then global. So I know how it feels from the different points of view when something like this is, is happening. 
but each one of those heads of marketing had research to prove that their positioning was right. Each one did. It's both. It's both. Okay? It's it's both. The interesting thing when you're running a region is that um, depending on the region that you're running, if you're running Asia Pacific, the level of similarities between the markets is nowhere to be found, but you still manage it as a region. Now, if you're talking Latin America, you may be able to leverage some scales on some initiatives. If you're managing the GCC, because of language and cultural affinities, you may be able to leverage some synergies. But it was both. It was absolutely both. One of the most important things that we did uh, here was, OK, so we have three levels of the organizations. We're going to have the global team, we're going to have the regional team, and we're going to have the local team. So what are going to be the roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities of each one? First thing that we did, yes? So what I did, which is what I'm ab about to say right now, was that I made each one of the regional guys part of my team. And I had two people from global. So in essence, it was a less than 10 people team that actually manage each and every one of the variables. Because the, the, the number one secret for getting alignment is getting people involved. It's very different when you're in a meeting and you're arguing to the tip of your voice and you're showing your research and are part of a decision-making power uh, p process than when someone from San Francisco comes in and said, by the way, voila, these are their roles and accountabilities and this is what you're going to do right now. So that we did from the, the very beginning. We brought in those regional uh, folks, and they help us through each and every one of the elements. So thank you for asking, for asking that. Each and every one of the elements that we're going to talk about now. So when we were doing this, which was a bit of a shakeup to the system, we started by local. We didn't start by global, or we didn't start by the region. What is the role of, uh, of the local? It's all about driving local relevance, and it's about driving the, the local market results. So that puts them in the driver's seat. And local relevance and l local results, it's where everything is built. 